All right, so we're going to start a new topic in 20th century history, one that appears in the news almost constantly, and it's this Israeli-Palestinian-Arab conflict, okay? Um, and a lot of times, you know, when we watch the news, we may be filled with confusion about what this actually means, how did it happen, and, and when did it get started? Why do Palestinians and Israelis seem to hate each other so much, and, and when did this start? Okay, so we'll kind of tease that out and go over a little bit of the, of the history um, heading up into the 80s. Um, the first thing you want to keep in mind is that Great Britain, before the war, is trying to limit Jewish immigration to Palestine. Okay, Palestine is this area on the map, all right? And after World War II, through the Palestinian Mandate, most of this kind of Middle East area, all right, is going to be split up between the British and the French. So um, this area, the mandate for Palestine, is going to go to the British, Lebanon to the French, Syria to the French, Iraq to the British, okay? The Palestine includes the modern-day states of Israel, which is right here, and then Jordan, which is right here, okay? Um, at the time, though, they are not separate states, okay? Um, Great Britain does not want Jews to, to immigrate to this area, all right, um, because of what's going on in the war. Jews are going to support the British no matter what, right? I mean, I mean, why would they not support the power that's trying to basically end the war and therefore end the Holocaust? So Jews, though, are, in a, little, are a little bit backed into a corner when it comes to Zionism or the formation of an independent Jewish state. Um, because Britain doesn't want to give up Arab support in this area. Why is that the case? Well, it's because the Arabs controlled the petroleum fields in these areas, okay? And if there was some sort of dig at their control of the land, the oil might stop flowing, okay? Um, the diaspora, I want to make sure to mention that. This refers to Jews that have settled um, outside of the Palestinian area, okay? Jerusalem, of course, is a, is a holy city, um, you know, built by David. Um, Israel represents the promised land of the Old Testament. And so, you know, going back and controlling this land is going to be very, very appealing for many Jews, all right? Um, and after 1945, after the end of World War II, both groups, Zionists and Palest or Jews and Palestinian Arabs, will push for independent states. At the time period, Palestinians will have two-thirds of the local population, and they're going to own 80% of the land. So this is a good picture right here, all right? All the green, all right, in 1946 is controlled by the Palestinians, okay? All the Jewish land is the white, okay, and it's controlled by Jews, of course, all right? So you want to make sure to monitor also how this color is changing as we move through time. Scientists are making historical religious arguments for controlling this territory again. They get support from the West um, because of the horrors of the Holocaust. There is seen as an immediate need for a place to put the survivors of the Holocaust. Anti-Semitism is no longer going to be supported really by any government. And as a result, the West starts to move towards actually supporting an independent state for Zionists, for Jews. Uh, the British, because they control Palestine, have to deal with this problem. They don't want to lose their petroleum, as well as their strategic location on the Mediterranean. Okay, they control the Suez Canal, which is just over here, just west of the Sinai Peninsula. But they want to have as much of a presence as they can on the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, um, because they don't want to to lose influence in the area. All right, so they don't want to anger Arabs, but they they also feel this moral need, a moral dilemma, to help Jews um, have a new place to settle. How they deal with the problem? They run away from it. They wash their hands, as your book says. They turn it over to the United Nations to deal with, okay? And in this um, United Nations Special Committee on Palestine report, they decide to go ahead and partition. Now, as after we studied India, you know that partition usually ends really poorly. Korea's partitioned ended in a war. Uh, India's partition ended not necessarily in a war, but in millions of people dying trying to get from one area to another, okay? Um, and, of course, the partition of Palestine is going to lead to wars which still, 70 years later, have not stopped. Um, Palestinians immediately oppose this problem because 50% of the land, which was the most fertile and on the coast, would now be controlled by Israelis. You can see it here. This is the next map here 
of the partition, notice how much area, especially on the coast, there's Tel Aviv, uh, is picked up by Jews. Okay, really the only areas left to Palestinians are the West Bank, all right, including all of Jerusalem, all right. Golan Heights, up here by Lebanon, and then the Gaza Strip. And then, of course, all of the southern part will be for Israel. This is mostly desert, so it's not necessarily super, you know, important. Um, Zionists are not necessarily really pumped about this plan either. They actually want more territory, um, if not the whole state. Um, in May 1948, the British withdraw very, very quickly, just as they had done in India, and David Ben-Gurion announced the creation of the Israeli state. Ben-Gurion, I'll give you a little picture of him. Ben-Gurion will be the first leader of a brand new Israeli state. Okay, um, He's actually born in Poland, and he will be part of this diaspora that will come back and lead inside of this area. He kind of looks like Bilbo Baggins to me. I don't know. Um, just, you know, it just reminds me of the character, even the hair. Anyway, he's the first prime minister of Israel. Um, and he will lead kind of this transfer of power over from um, from basically a, a non-state to a brand new a brand new uh, Israeli state. I um, was actually in office for for close to 15 years. Okay. Now Palestinians will not recognize a new state, and we get a war. Okay. Arabs, of course, are not going to be very well prepared. There are a lot of disadvantages. Um, bad leadership, divided chains of command, terrible weapons, and no clear military strategy. Um, you know, the Israelis, the Jews, have a, an amazing reason to fight, right? They're fighting for the creation of an independent state after having the majority of the people in the world killed, right? So that's something to fight um, about. Um, but the Arabs really can't unify, all right? Um, and, and as a result, they end up losing. Um, actually, a 33% or a third more land than the original partition. The West Bank will go to Jordan. So here's the West Bank. All right. It'll be administered by Jordan. Uh, Jerusalem will be split. That's why we see this line going curling through Jerusalem. Gaza Strip will be administered by Egypt. Um, and basically, all Palestinians are going to be um, under the control of other powers, right? So Palestinians don't even remotely control any of their own land anymore. One million are going to be homeless, and this is where we're going to start to see the first unrest that are going to lead to terrorist organizations um, that are going to come to the forefront later in the 80s and 90s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, Israel will not look to return the refugees from areas where they're pushed out, and no peace treaty is ever... Uh, ever, ever made from this war. So, um, you know, the war kind of rages on. There's kind of a, you know, reapportionment of territory, but no sort of clear definition of where borders are and who's in control of Jerusalem, right? Or who's in control of really any area. And can that, um, can that continue? Um, Israel is looking to develop their own state. Of course, they need to figure out their political, economic, and military structure. Um, they're going to end up choosing a multi-party system, move towards capitalism and manufacturing, and therefore align with Western ideas of, econo of economics and politics. Um, small factories produce a lot of weapons, also cut diamonds and other precious stones. And they're going to pour a lot of their military, sorry, a lot of their budget into the military. Okay, So as a result, right, they're going to need weapons okay, and loans from, from those powers who have uh, money and, and weapons to give, and those are going to include France initially, the United States, and other Jewish communities. Okay, So Israel gets on its feet and is growing, um, and we're going to have a little bit of a shift in power in 1952. Um, new leader, uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser, pull him up, comes to power. Um, remember, Egypt had been more or less a protectorate, all right? Um, Oh, Abdel Nasser, they changed that. Had been a protectorate. It's funny, my Google spell check wanted to change it earlier. And um, you know, they more or less get their self-determination of governments, all right, just before uh, Nasser comes in, right? So after World War II, there's kind of a push for Egyptian independence. They get it, okay? He's gonna be the second president. Um, and he is truly a 
a man interested in a strong Egypt and an Egypt that controls its own resources. And, and the first thing they want to control is water, all right? He wants to build this dam, the Aswan High Dam, okay? Let me make sure of that. And he actually says it's going to be, you know, as magnificent as 17 Great Pyramids or something like that. Um, but anyway, this is his big, grand kind of uh, project that's going to resurrect the Egyptian economy. Uh, remember, Egypt is mostly desert. These are all pictures of, of the dam, by the way, and the waters. I'm trying to find a good one that shows you just how much. I guess this one's a good, pretty good one. Um, you know, it wants to be this, you know, water is scarce, and so the dam is going to, of course, going to help trap water way down, right, in the interior of Egypt, right? So land around the Nile is very fertile, um, but having a dam, having water, it will enable them basically to irrigate lots of areas, right, um, that are in the interior of Egypt. So he decides he wants to build it. Initially, he looks to the West for help and the World Bank. They don't give it to him. He turns to the Soviet Union. He also turns to China. He signs an arms deal with Czechoslovakia, right? Czechoslovakia, of course, is uh, behind the Iron Curtain, so they're communist. As a result, okay, of um, basically being told no by the U.S., Nasser decides he's going to seize or nationalize the Suez Canal in 1956. And the West is absolutely befuddled, okay? Uh, Britain and France um, control the company that administers the Suez Canal. They built the Suez Canal, right? There's the Suez Canal, by the way. And they're, they're pissed, right? Because this company is there to make profits, right? And shareholders pay into this company and expect a return. Well, when a different power seizes or nationalizes that, the corporation is basically defunct, all right? Britain and France does, very secretly, is get the support of the Israelis, and the Israelis launch an attack across the Sinai Peninsula. So here they go, across the Sinai Peninsula, all right? At the same time, all right, British and French forces are parachuting, all right, to the west of the Suez Canal, all right, with the hopes of re-seizing it. This campaign, the 1956 war, the Suez Crisis, was a military success, but a political failure, okay? Um, they basically retake the Suez Canal, or at least it's going to be um, administered by the UN, but Nasser doesn't fall. And if anything, he actually is stronger because it's showing that the West is indeed trying to keep emerging powers like Egypt uh, kind of at bay, right? Uh, U.S. opposes this whole thing. So the U.S. is never involved. We do not send troops at all. Um, we kind of stay out of this, of this um, war. The British, French, and Israeli forces will withdraw. All right, Israel will get access to the port of Eilat. All right, Eilat is going to be down here. The very, very actually, I need to get that lot. The very, very tippy, tippy, tippy tip of Israel. All right, all right. So they get a port down here, so next to Egypt. That that helps them get through the Straits of Tehran, which will link kind of this body of water uh, with the Gulf of Aqaba. Okay, so. Another strategic location, now Israel, right, doesn't even need to ship anything through the Suez Canal. They can just go an overland route whoop, down to Eilat, and then, boom, here are the Straits of Tehran, sorry, um, through here, right, so they can go through the Gulf of Aqaba, and then out. So, it's a way of bypassing Egyptian control, basically, all right. Um, now, um, there's no peace settlement after this war. All right, what's going to happen is in another 11 years, um, it, it's, it's, you know, there's no real solution, just like there's no real solution in the 1948 war. Nasser's still in power. He's going to ask UN forces to withdraw from Egyptian territory. The leader of the UN, uh, Yutant, all right, will reluctantly agree. As a result, Israel and Egypt, though, prepare for war, okay? Um, e Egypt and Syria at the time had had a mutual defense pact. King Hussein of Jordan, which now is officially split off from Israel, will also agree to join Nasser. So this looks like a pretty formidable kind of surrounding defense against 
Israel, right? Syria is up here, Jordan here, Egypt here, okay? Now, the United States and Soviet Union are going to try and step in, diffuse attention. Israel, right, thinking that they are out, outnumbered and geographically surrounded, attack first. Very effective, okay? They destroy Egypt's airfields in six hours, right? That's it, just six. And even though the war lasts six days, right, we call it the six-day war, it really, you know, was one of the first six hours. Israel will occupy Gaza Strip. They'll occupy the entire Sinai Peninsula, which is mostly desert. So keep that in mind. They'll occupy the West Bank and the Golan Heights, right? So they basically used the war as an excuse to occupy these two areas. Egypt, of course, is, you know, has nothing, to, no desire for these two areas anyway. Nasser is going to resign as a result of this, um, but the Egyptian people want his return. Okay, so huge land grab in 1967 for Israel. All right, they're willing to negotiate returning the land except Jerusalem. They want to keep it. All right, they unify it, proclaim it the capital of Israel. The UN, interestingly enough, does not recognize any of these territorial gains and actually sees Israel as the aggressor in this military conflict. Uh, 200,000 refugees, Palestinian refugees, will leave the West Bank to go to the East Bank in Jordan. Okay, um, only a little bit are allowed to return after the war, and then once again we have no formal peace settlement. Okay, so anyway, if you're paying attention here, you should know that we've had three wars. There's been no peace settlement. Um, basically, Israel has grabbed more and more land. All right, through aggressive action. Right, not necessarily through any prompting. They have not been invaded. They've not been, um, you know, tested at all. Right. Um, the only thing that's happened that as an aggressive action was the nationalization of the Suez Canal, which they didn't necessarily administer anyway, okay? So, there's a lot of Israeli aggression here, right? All right, you want to make sure to, to pay that attention, because the U.S. is now an ally, and traditionally has been an ally with Israel. Although, notice through these first three wars, the U.S. is not allies at all, okay? Um, it's really not until much later that the U.S. will come to the aid of Israel. Palestinians rightly conclude that no powers are going to help them get an independent state. Guerrilla forces grow um, under an umbrella known as the Palest Palestine Liberation Organization, or the PLO. You might have seen that in the news. And the largest of these groups was Al-Fatah, led by Yasser Arafat. Okay, there's Yasser Arafat. You may have seen him in the news or his picture. He was much more active in the 90s and the 2000s before he died. Um, but he was the head of one of these largest subgroups. Okay. Um, what they do is they raid into Israeli territories. Um, they turn to terrorist tactics and skyjackings, assassinations, and bombings, right? This is their, their pathway to try and secure recognition of an independent state. They feel like they've been backed into a corner and there's nothing else to do besides uh, use terrorist acts, okay? Um, and this is really where we get the association with terrorism, all right, or of terrorism with Middle Eastern. Um, groups. Initially, it's a nationalist terrorist group, not religious. Now, it's become religious, so we want to keep that in mind. All right, we're getting another war, our fourth war in 1973, the Yom Kippur War. Yom Kippur is, of course, the Jewish New Year. Um, this happens, Nasser will die in 1970. Um, a new president, Anwar Sadat, will come to power. There's this guy, Anwar Sadat. All right, and he is going to be, you know, a nationalist Egyptian leader, but also very aggressive, okay? Um, he, he, you know, he is very, very interested in taking back lost Egyptian territory, okay? And so in 1973, he's going to launch um, an attack into Israel, right, to take back the Egyptian territory, including the Sinai Peninsula. Um, Israel will launch a successful counterattack, all right? And they actually end up crossing the canal, right, into... You guys could say mainland Egypt, okay? Um, this is where this conflict becomes a Cold War conflict. The Soviets will back Syria, who of course allied with Egypt. The United States will supply arms to Israel. So notice this is 1973, and this is really the first time we see the United States stepping in on one side. One side, rather, okay? Both sides will claim victory in this conflict after a ceasefire. Um, and, and really the, the conflict is mediated between Soviets and Secretary of State um, for the United States, Henry Kissinger, okay? Um, 
Sadat, though, is going to be more willing to give up gains, though, as he enters in negotiations with the U.S. Um, at the same time, the Saudi, the Saudi Arabians are threatening to restrict their oil production for any nation that supports Israel. Of course, this would include the United States. Uh, but after some talks, the Suez Canal is reopened. Israel, Israeli troops, troops were partially withdrawn from the Sinai and Golan Heights. All right, but Israelis were refused to include the Palestinians in these talks. All right, so, you know, another basically loss for Palestinians trying to, to grab attention of world powers to say, hey, we are here, we need our own state. Hello, can you please include us as you're adjusting our boundaries and adjusting who's occupying who um, to have some self-determination. Uh, the final peace treaty is signed in 1979. Um, Sadat visits Israel in 1977. Okay, President Jimmy Carter will mediate talks between Sadat and the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Menachem Begin. All right, and these are the Camp David talks. All right, Camp David is the presidential retreat just outside Washington D.C. They sit down in the late 70s and, and kind of hammer this out. Um, <clears throat> these talks do provide for the gradual return of the Sinai to Egypt. Um, once again, do not address issues of Palestinian self-determination or the Israeli occupation of West Bank, Gaza Strip, okay? Um, and also, uh, no, st no, no decisions on, on Jerusalem either, okay? Palestinians, as you expect, would oppose it. Egypt is more or less pushed to the outside of the Arab world, all right, and actually gets assassinated by Egyptian Muslim radicals, all right, trying to create an Islamic revolution. Um, Sadat's successor... Hosni Mubarak will institute what we would call a cold peace between Egypt and Israel, which kind of has persisted to today. Last war we'll mention is the 1982 war in Lebanon. Okay, uh, violence is going to flip back to the northern side of Israel. Okay, so there's Lebanon, used to be French controlled. In 1982, all right, there's going to be an invasion of Lebanon by Israel. Well, why is that happening? 1970s, the PLO, right, so this kind of guerrilla group that's fighting for independence for Palestinians, used southern Lebanon as a base and launched attacks at Israel. They, um, Israel will raid um, southern Lebanon in 82, all right, they would no longer tolerate, sorry, in 1980, no longer tolerate the PLO, which had created a state within a state, okay? Um, sorry, this is 1982. Israel will launch a full-scale invasion of Lebanon, killing thousands of people, mostly civilians, and they also besiege Beirut. And Beirut, at the time, was actually one of the pr most beautiful cities in the Middle East. Um, it was actually a vacation spot for uh, you know, many, many, many Europeans. All right, you can see it here. Very you know, beautiful hotels. Um, modern conveniences, you could go, actually go skiing, right? So, you know, this is all Beirut right here, right? So, I mean, it was a place to go and, and visit, all right? Um, looked very European even. And it's going to be absolutely destroyed. And it's, we'll actually talk more about that in class, how it happened, all right? Thousands of people die with this invasion, all right, mostly civilians, all right? PLO fighters will evacuate, and the rightist leader of the Lebanese militia, Bashir Gemal, um, Gemayal, sorry, was elected president, but it's going to be assassinated afterwards, right? So we get hundreds of, of Palestinians in refugee camps are going to be massacred by Lebanese Christian soldiers, and we have this religious conflict that, that more or less rages across Lebanon for, you know, um, the, the majority of the early 80s. Um, Israel withdraws from much of the southern Lebanon in 1982. They do leave a security zone, which is going to be this entire southern part of of Lebanon, right? Um, Syrians will also leave troops in the area. Um, now, what has it been like since then? All right, well, we won't get into the actual modern uh, story of Israeli-Palestinian relationships until the next couple of chapters, but basically the 1982 war is kind of the last blow for Palestinian liberation movements, okay? Um, and it, it starts fragmenting and starts to divide, all right? Also, there's divisions inside of Israel, okay? Many people, or many Israelis, are sick of the violence at this point, right? It's been 34 years of war, five full war, wars. And 
we get a split. Um, the Likud, the Conservative Party, right, wants to keep all territory gained, but the Labour Party, leftist, is willing to have a land for peace settlement, which they give up land, right, to, to have peace. Um, but the Israeli government will continue not to negotiate with the PLO in the 1980s. 1.4 million Palestinians become more and more hostile, become more and more fed up. All right, in 1987, we get an uprising known as an intifada by young Palestinians. They boycott all Israeli goods and services. Um, Israel cracks down with an iron fist policy. A thousand Palestinians die, right? That pushes the PLO to, to declare their independence for Palestine in 1988. Um, they do recognize the existence of Israel, and they once again call for negotiations. 1991, um, parties meet in Madrid for talks mediated by the United States. Uh, these centered on withdrawal of Israel and self-determination for Pal Palestinians. All right, but despite these negotiations, Israel continued to build new settlements and maintain military control in Palestine during this time. And so what we get by 2000, and this is looking ahead maybe a little too much, is a map that looks like this, right? Where Palestinians have more or less been subjected to a very small amount of territory in the West Bank, right? And then, of course, in the Gaza Strip. And that's it goes from there to there in 54 years, right? You can imagine that's why Palestinians have a reason to be mad, right? Not to, I mean, especially given that um, two-thirds two of the population of this entire area, right, in 1946 was Palestinian. All right, there'll be more on this story as we keep moving forward, but that is the brief history of war and the conflict raging between Israelis and Palestinians. Good luck in your questions. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks.